everyone. Uh, good to meet you. Good morning. Good uh, afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, the purpose of this uh, live stream today is to introduce you the conference that will be running tomorrow uh, regarding the three main venues uh, that one should see visiting Paris. Uh, ten highlights uh, that had to be uh, selected out of a large number, as you can imagine. Uh, my purpose in selecting these uh, uh, these venues was to give you uh, a rather wide array of uh, the different periods uh, covered uh, by uh, the monuments in Paris, starting with Roman times and finishing in rather modern times uh, with the uh, Eiffel Tower. Talking a little bit about myself, I have been a guide conférencier, as we are called here uh, in Paris since uh, for a long time, since 1986. Uh, and besides, um, after actually a career in uh, sales and marketing and an MBA and so on, I decided to uh, focus myself on art history, which uh, was and still is a passion. Uh, took a master's in art history and art market, uh, as I was myself uh, a historian and an art collector. Um, I have been in Paris for almost 30 years uh, now, which may, gives me a rather good knowledge uh, of the place. Uh, regarding uh, the different venues covered, we're starting uh, tomorrow, not today, uh, with the oldest monument that is still standing in Paris, namely the Roman Bath, uh, the four being the modern city that it is today, Paris uh, used to be uh, a rather important Roman city, integrated into the Roman Empire the year 57 uh, BC when Julius Caesar conquered uh, the place. Uh, and ever since uh, it extended as a Roman city on the both sides of uh, the Seine River, uh, both sides of uh, the central river that crosses uh, Paris. Uh, the second uh, monument that I chose uh, to tell you more about was Notre Dame, uh, a very important uh, building that has been recently damaged uh, by the fire that you all heard of, but also a masterpiece of Gothic art. Then number three comes uh, the one I decided to focus today as a sample, uh, the Saint Chapel, which was the private chapel of French kings in their chateau uh, on the Ile de la Cité. And further in history, uh, we will continue tomorrow with the Louvre Palace, uh, a Renaissance palace initially for the older part that can still be uh, visited, can still be seen today. It was started building in 1539, followed with uh, the 1600s, with the Invalids Hospital, the other big project of King Louis XIV uh, besides Versailles, uh, as he was building for himself the most splendid ever uh, chateau, uh, Le Chateau de Versailles, uh, the king decided to, uh, construct, to, to build by the side of the old city of Paris, a hospital uh, to host his uh, wounded soldiers who were coming from all the campaigns uh, around uh, Europe. Uh, after the Invalids Hospital and the Bar French Baroque uh, period of the 1600s, uh, we will move to the Place de la Concorde, a beautiful example of uh, 18th century urbanism uh, with a, a rather complicated uh, planning for this uh, square that used to be a royal square built around the statue of Louis uh, the 15th. Further in time, we will move to Napoleon's period with the Arc de Triomphe, Arch of Triumph, that was started building in 1806 by the emperor to celebrate his victory uh, over uh, the uh, allies. Uh, the victory of Austerlitz, his first major victory. And we will keep on in the 1800s uh, with uh, the Sacré Coeur of Montmartre, the Basilic uh, of the uh, Holy Heart, celebrating the Holy Heart of uh, Jesus, that was erected uh, starting in 1875. Then the mythical, obviously, Eiffel Tower, uh, the city landmark. Uh, erected, there was supposed to be a temporary building erected in 1889, the World, World Trade Fair of 1889, uh, celebrated in Paris uh, for the first centennial of the French Revolution. And then the most modern of all, the latest addition 
uh, to this uh, array of uh, venues, uh, the Louvre Pyramid, uh, the work of Ye Ming Pei, this Chinese American architect who uh, built in the middle of the old uh, French royal palace and then museum of the Louvre, uh, the um, rather provocative back then and rather controversial uh, glass pyramid that is now one of the, uh, well, must-sees of uh, Paris. All right. Uh, I'm going to skip uh, a few slides uh, to go straight to the venue that I chose today to show you as an example of the many places we will virtually visit up tomorrow. Up tomorrow, well, depending on your time, uh, it will be in the afternoon here. Uh, we will skip directly to the Sainte Chapelle, which is probably the most central together with Notre Dame, since it was erected, as you can see on uh, the map here, on the central island called the Ile de la Cité, the city island of Paris as the private chapel of the French kings uh, in their palace. This is a general view. The former royal palace has been turned now in a, a palace of justice, the course of justice. Uh, the facade, the classical facade with its columns and the two wings dating back to the 1780s when they had to be reconstructed after a fire. The medieval part that remains visible is the chapel you see to the left a Gothic chapel. There was a finished building in 1248. It was actually built by French King Louis IX, later uh, called Saint Louis, after he was uh, recognized a saint uh, by the Catholic Church. Uh, and it was built as a shrine to uh, keep uh, the holy relics of the passion that the French King had purchased for the from the emperor in Byzance, uh, the Byzantine emperor, uh, the Greek capital, Byzance, uh, and the most important of which was obviously the uh, crown of thorns of Jesus. It is considered as a, a masterpiece, maybe the absolute masterpiece of Gothic architecture, and we're going to see why. Uh, among the treasures that were kept for centuries in this um, in this chapel stands uh, the outstanding uh, crown of thorns of Jesus, which is now kept in Notre Dame. You have a picture of uh, its uh, reliquary uh, with the crown of thorns inside on the screen. A crown of thorns that has lost any uh, thorns at all since uh, the thorns uh, were progressively given out as diplomatic gifts to uh, different royal visitors visiting the French royal family, as well as to important churches uh, around Europe given as relics. So we now have a, a crown uh, with the, just the central part, the central part, and uh, all the, the thorns uh, gone. Besides uh, this uh, crown of thorns uh, stands a piece of the cross, which is a rather big one, 24 centimeters long, which is uh, kept also in the treasure of Notre Dame. You have it on the screen here. Uh, and a nail of the passion, the central one, a nail that was used to crucify uh, Jesus on his uh, cross. The Saint Chapelle that was built uh, for uh, this purpose is a typical royal chapel with two levels. All royal chapels were arranged in two levels, one on the ground floor for commoners, the staff of the palace, uh, common visitors, and uh, the top chapel, the most magnificent, was designed for the use of the royal family, uh, the king himself, his wife, and their closer guests. It is a very special Gothic monument, since contrary to most of the churches of that period, it is deprived of any kind of flying buttress uh, that have been, they have been replaced instead of that uh, with simple buttresses, thick ones, but simple buttresses designed to keep, of course, the building uh, standing. It is typical of the Gothic Revolution that was started in architecture here in Paris, north of Paris, the year 1143, when the abbot of the Abbey de, of the Abbey de Saint-Denis, the Abbey of Saint-Denis, 
decided of the reconstruction of his church, but with a new type of architecture. Instead of Romanesque, that was the rule until then, he opted for a system that we now call Gothic, based on peaked arches and ribbed vaults. And that was a deep revolution in architecture, since the dynamics of the building was uh, dramatically altered. In Romanesque round barrel vaults, as you can see on the left part of my screen, uh, the weight of the vault pushes to the sides. So you need very thick walls with very few windows uh, to keep uh, the building standing. Whereas with the new system of peaked uh, arches and uh, ribbed vaults, the weight of the building, the weight of the, of the vault pushes downwards from top to bottom, uh, rather than sidewards, which allowed building way higher churches uh, with a lot more windows. That was the whole purpose in uh, inventing and then de developing uh, Gothic uh, technology. How could a structure like the St. Chapel uh, stand without the traditional flying buttresses? It has long been a bit of mystery, but a few, well, decades ago, uh, the secret uh, was uh, uncovered, uh, hidden somewhere in the masonry and hidden uh, in, under the roof and uh, within uh, the stained glasses, uh, stands an iron structure made of a round, uh, a round an iron bell that circulates all around the chapel. And uh, this iron bell is complemented with a series of iron stitches uh, hidden under the roof uh, that keep uh, the both uh, side walls uh, together. You have here a picture of uh, the Saint Chapelle with uh, uh, red lines uh, that indicate the position of these uh, huge stitches under the roof and of the red uh, and of the, the iron belt that runs uh, through uh, the windows. This chapel is a double chapel with on the ground floor a ground chapel, a ground chapel which is lower than the top one and that was designed uh, for uh, commoners and the staff members who were working in the royal palace back then who also needed uh, a place uh, to go to mass. None of the painted decor of this chapel is original since it was damaged in seven oca several occasions, in particular with the big floods that we had in the 1600s and that have erased any traces of the original paint on the wall. So the painted decor that you see today is a reconstitution uh, of the uh, 1800s when the chapel was restored. None of the stained glasses is original either for exactly the same reasons. The Grand Chapel, however, has uh, kept something very exceptional for a building that uh, shows the quality uh, of its conception uh, as a royal chapel, a series of 12 medallions made of carved limestone, surrounded with tiles, colored tiles with colored tiles with uh, a gilt decor, and uh, a series of um, uh, tainted of stained uh, tainted uh, glass beads integrated in the wall. They also have been restored in the 1800s, uh, but uh, most of the structure is still original from the 1200s. This is an example of those uh, 12 apostles. We have another one here that denotes the high standard of quality uh, applied to the construction of uh, this chapel for the 1200s. Uh, the ground chapel is also covered with a heraldry, uh, a, a system, a combination of her heraldic uh, symbols on the walls, namely the traditional French fleur de lis, the oldest French royal symbol that you also have in America where the French uh, used to be, uh, combined with uh, the uh, gilt castle on a red background, uh, which is typical of the Castilian shield, because Louis IX, future Saint Louis, was uh, a French king, but on his mother's side, a, a descendant on the, of the kings of Castilia in uh, Spain, the central kingdom of Spain. The upper chapel is by far the most uh, prestigious, the most uh, 
flamboyant, uh, with uh, a ceiling uh, vault that has kept its original uh, sky painted in blue, covered with stars, uh, an imitation of what they thought was the creation of God. Uh, Earth back then in the 1200s is considered to be a flat surface, obviously. And why is it that uh, we have stars above our heads? It's because God, they think, has built a huge vault to protect us over our heads. And this vault he has adorned with uh, the gilt, the glittering stars uh, that we see. Uh, this is what is uh, reproduced in uh, some of the uh, most lavish churches of the 1200s. On the right hand side, uh, the picture uh, shows the central altarpiece with above the altar uh, a sort of canopy under which the reliquary, all the, with all the relics of passion, uh, was exhibited uh, and, uh, until the, the French Revolution. Part of this altar, about 60 to 70 percent, is still original. Some of it had to be reconstituted. It had been dismounted during the French Revolution. Uh, it, it was remounted in the 1800s, but some parts that had uh, disappeared had to be reconstituted, like in particular uh, the top canopy that was recreated based on the original designs uh, that were known. The vault itself is rather spectacular, uh, as you can see from here. Uh, what makes it the most absolute uh, marvel of Gothic art is the total absence of walls. As previously mentioned, the purpose of Gothic as a style of the Gothic Revolution was to replace uh, a maximum of the walls uh, with uh, huge panels of windows adorned with huge panels of stained glasses. In the case of the Prussian Saint Chapel, there are just no walls left at all, uh, and the whole space is occupied with those, uh, is uh, filled with those magnificent stained glasses. Seen from closer, uh, this is a vision of the very lavish ornaments of uh, the central altar, with angels praying and the two central ones carrying the holy crown of thorns in a combination of carved and painted limestone, together with the fleur de lis in the background, together with tiles, tiles uh, covered with uh, gold and blue um, glazer, uh, which is a technological marvel, uh, the gold glazer for uh, the 1200s. Uh, again, everything has to be understood back in the context uh, of the 1200s. Uh, all around uh, the chapel, the, uh, the, the, the carved uh, sculpted decor is also uh, highly, very impressive and very significant. You have on each of the 12 pillars a statue of one of the 12 apostles that are indeed, in a symbolic way, the 12 pillars of the Catholic Church. All along the walls, you have a gallery running of blind windows adorned with medallions that represents the martyrs, the Catholic martyrs, the Christian martyrs in general, who uh, were uh, who were martyred, who offered their lives in imitation to the way that Jesus himself offered his uh, life on the cross. Here is a medallion representing with the original painting and paint of the 1200s, Saint Sebastian, who was martyred with uh, bows and arrows. And all these saints that sacrificed their lives for their faith are receiving in heaven crowns that are handed over to them by angels. This is uh, uh, what the angels uh, in the corner uh, above the scenes are doing, distributing the crowns. Uh, images of Jesus's uh, crown of spine of thorns uh, on the cross. Uh, also a parallel with the crown, the French royal crown that the French king has received from God himself, the way he was, the moment he was, the day he was consecrated uh, king of France by the church, a very symbolic use. 
by the side on both sides of this uh, chapel, you also have two oratories, one for the queen, not the wife of Louis IX, but his mother, uh, Blanche de Castille, Bianca Blanca de Castilla. This is the oratory for the queen. You have exactly the same one with a different decor on the other side uh, for uh, the king. But what makes the value and the fame of this Saint Chapelle around the world are by far the uh, wonderful 15 stained glass panels, very high ones, 49 feet high stained glasses panels that are still pretty much original. 80% uh, of these stained glasses are still original from the 1200s. And this uh, must be underlined, uh, must be stressed as it is quite exceptional uh, for a Gothic cathedral. The stained glasses are obviously the most fragile part of the building and often had to be replaced in time uh, when they were destroyed for whatever reason, fires, bombings, uh, incidents of all kinds. Uh, the 15 stained glasses are actually developing, displaying an important uh, iconographic program, uh, which is serving two purposes uh, combined. The first purpose of this program of stained glasses is to tell the history of the world. Starting with uh, Genesis, the beginning of the world, you have here one of those panels that represents Adam and Eve in paradise, with uh, Eve giving the apple that was entrusted uh, to her, that was given to her by the state, the devil, giving uh, the apple to Adam, and on the right-hand side, uh, the archangel Gabriel uh, kicking uh, Adam and Eve away from paradise for having uh, committed the original sin of eating this apple. From uh, Genesis, the beginning of the world, to Passion, the Passion of Christ, which is obviously described right above the altar where uh, the uh, relics of the Passion were kept. You have here the coronation, the most significant episode when it comes to the church. We're talking about the coronation of Jesus with his crown of thorns, right? From uh, Genesis to Passion to present times in the 1200s, with here a scene of the moment when uh, Saint Louis, King of France, is bringing the relics of the Passion to Paris. You see it on the lowest part of the panel, the king himself holding the reliquary of the true cross in his hands. He's got a typical uh, yellow gold crown on the head. Right, and the last episode of this story is obviously the end of the world, the apocalypse that has been described in his gospel by Saint John, Saint John the Evangelist. Uh, it is not uh, the original stained glass from the 1200s, since it was entirely redesigned and redone uh, by another French king around 1490. And here you have one of these uh, the episodes. One of these episodes of uh, the threat of um, the, the end of the world of doomsday, the apocalypse, the moment when Christ appears surrounded with the seven churches uh, represented here uh, with the uh, seven with seven candle different candlesticks. You have noticed the important difference in style between the stained glasses of the 1200s and those of uh, the uh, late 1400s and of the Gothic that we call flamboyant. Gothic. The other purpose uh, that this cycle of um, stained glasses serves is the glorification of the king, the French king, of course, who has his uh, chapel and praise uh, in this uh, place. Uh, just above the oratory, which is designed to the king, you have uh, a, a number, the 28 kings of Judah that are depicted. And uh, the theme of the kings is always the one that is uh, put forward throughout the program that describes the history of humankind. Uh, together with the history of humankind, the role of monarchs and crowned heads in general is constantly uh, put forward, as is the case here. Uh, the King Asterius is depicted here interrogating Esther. It is also a way for the king to glorify his dynasty. As you find on uh, the uh, glass panels, the same combination of uh, golden castles for Castilia uh, on a yellow background 
and uh, golden fleur de lis on the blue background of uh, the French uh, of the French um, of the French shield. Actually, these uh, stained glasses that had last been restored in the 1800s were until recently rather, well, very sometimes dirty and oxidized. So they have undergone in recent years from uh, 2008 to 2016, an, an in-depth restoration that consisted in cleansing them as you can be, as you can see here on one of the panels of the West Rose from the 14, late 1400s. Uh, one of those panels uh, that form part of, uh, that describe uh, Doomsday, uh, the um, apocalypsis. And they have been protected, which is more important for the future, with something that uh, an unprecedented type of thermoformed glass panels that uh, adapt uh, very precisely to the very shape of each single stained glass so as to protect them from the exterior, avoid any kind of pollution and dampness to, to touch them, uh, leaving a minimum of uh, space uh, between uh, the outside protective glass and uh, the inside uh, precious uh, stained glass. This St. Chapel is now opened to visitors, obviously, uh, and it's one of the venues uh, you can come and explore in Paris uh, if you uh, have come and visit us. But it's also a reputed concert hall uh, that uh, performs, that hosts concerts all, all around the season. Uh, so it's, uh, well, one of the uh, 10 venues that we will uh, uh, discuss more widely uh, tomorrow. Uh, afternoon for me, but uh, morning for some of you. Uh, this is uh, the presentation I had, I, I could uh, give you today on uh, one of those 10 venues, the St. Chapel. I'm now going to read through the questions, as we might have uh, questions that I will be able to answer. Do you have any questions? Um. Just to make things a little easier for a little while, yeah. did post a question since we had quite a few comments and responses from uh, people within the chat. Okay. Post your question again. That would um, help us make sure we don't miss anything. Uh, but in the meantime, just while you may take be taking a moment to do that, Laurent, thank you for a wonderfully informative live stream and uh, presentation. Here is a link to that conversation tomorrow, which will be beginning at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Um, Laurent, uh, Doria asked if you can share the first slide again. The first slide again. Okay, so let me carry this. The first slide on the St. Chapel? Um, I believe so. She did not specify, but um, if not, please let us know. There is the first this slide. This is the first slide of the St. Chapel that displays uh, actually the, the former royal palace was given up, uh, given up as a royal palace by Charles V, King of France in the 1300s. In 1365, exactly, he moved from the old royal palace on the city island, Ile de la Cité, to the new one, the Louvre, another venue. Uh, he left behind two of his administrations. One was the archives, and the other one was the justice, the royal justice. And uh, ever since, uh, it, uh, the, the, the former royal palace has been um, uh, the um, Palace of Justice, the Course of Justice, the main course, Court of Justice in Paris. Unfortunately, part of the structure was uh, made of wood and uh, burnt down in the 1700s. Hence the presence of two uh, periods on that picture, uh, the original uh, Gothic chapel in the background, but the very neoclassical uh, facade of uh, the, 18, seven, the the 1780s uh, of uh, the Court of Justice itself. If that was uh, the, uh, the, the the slide you wanted to see, that was the. I think Doria said thumbs up. That's the slide that she was looking for. Good. Okay. Then. Uh, Lauren, do you see the two questions after that, or do you want me to read them out for you? Yeah, you, it's better if you can read them, because some of them are questions, others are not. 
Yeah, I, I got you. Um, Deborah asks, had the crown of thorns been carbon or scientifically dated? No, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. Uh, uh, not to my knowledge, anyway. It's always very controversial because even the, the carbon dating can sometimes be uh, controversial. Um, it is very unlikely, to be frank with you, that it really be the original crown of thorns of Jesus. All these uh, relics were actually uh, brought to uh, Constantinopolis back then uh, in the 300s by St. Helen, when St. Helen, the mother of Emperor Constantine, uh, went to uh, get them. So uh, they probably date back to the 300s uh, rather than to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the age of Christ. But that is obviously very controversial. 